here. Our next speakers came all the way from Crater Lake. Crater Lake is a natural formation in a now inactive volcano. And in the center of what is now, again, a lake in a crater, there is Wizard Island. A beautiful place for campers and lovers of nature to frolic and play. It's also a beloved place of the Wizard Island ghosts. Usually the scourge of park rangers, the Wizard Island ghosts have a known modus operandi. They set fires, campfires usually, but any fire will do pretend to be standing around it, and then when the park ranger comes to say, you can't set fires here, they disappear. Pranksters, lovely little poltergeists. We, however, know them as Lucy Wyman and Zach Reichert. I thought she was gonna stop it there, wizards, so. <laughs> I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. If you want to much, we have to to advance your Okay. Yep. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Quilk, where we answer the question, are our tests any good? These slides are available online. If you want to refer back to them later, follow along on your own machine. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to tell you is what we're going to tell you, a roadmap. Uh, so first we'll talk about some of the problems that are unique to testing a puppet. That doesn't mean that they're like exclusive to testing a puppet, but we do want to define uh, the particular problems that we face. We'll talk about why we built the tool called Quelk. We'll talk about what Quelk is and how we're using it to make informed decisions. We'll uh, talk about Quelk version 1 versus Quelk version 2 since we uh, just transitioned from v1 to v2 and the underlying technologies of both of those and how we decided what to use, all that good stuff. We'll do a really quick demo of Quelk v2 and then we'll talk about uh, what's next for our project. So the next first thing is who we are. I'm Lucy. I'm Zach. And we are software developers in test, which means that we use software in all of the ways that you never expected it to be used. <laughs> Something like that. Um, and I'd also like to say that this talk is kind of like tragically short and simple in the way that it can be summarized in a sentence. And that sentence is this. You can use data to make your tests more efficient and cheaper using science. Um, so this is a theme that we'll be referring back to throughout the talk. And if you take away one thing from this talk, it is exactly this, that like data about your tests helps you make decisions, like most things. So testing at Puppet, they're not really just Puppet problems, they're probably everybody's problems. Uh, so pipelines for enterprise components, open source components, uh, seven Puppet master platforms, 40 plus agent platforms, two to three release branches for every component slash product. That gets major seed and we have quite a few pipelines and quite a few tests. And it's actually a little overwhelming sometimes. Too many lines. Great delivery. Thanks. Um, all right, so let's go on a little bit of a philosopher's journey. Uh, this project was started when someone asked the question, are our tests providing value? Because if they're not, they're really expensive to run and our AWS bill is only going up and to the right. So uh, what can we do about that? Maybe cut some tests. But when we asked, are our tests providing value? That led to kind of a deeper question, which is what makes a test valuable? Uh, and we were thought about it for a long time and came to the answer that tests are valuable if they tell us our code is broken. So then which tests are telling us that our code is broken? Usually it's the ones where the tests break and then uh, we can like determine that our code, or our tests fail rather, and we can tell that our code is broken from those failures, but that led us to the question, can a test that never fails provide value? Like is that telling us that our code is working or just that we have really bad tests? Uh, so this all, culminated in the main question that led us to make Quelk, which is, are our tests worth the cost of running them? Because if they're not, we should probably not be running them. 
And uh, the last question we asked ourselves is why is Grafana so terrible? Um, so what is Quilk? Quilk is uh, quality, assurance, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, but really Grafana, we like immediately determined that Kibana was not gonna cut it for this project. Um, and like most things that use Grafana, it is a dashboard for aggregating and visualizing data about our acceptance testing and our testing pipelines. So being able to visualize this data allows us to make data-informed decisions based on things like test duration. So if a test is taking longer than like 10 minutes to run, then we should probably examine that test and see either can we make it shorter or is it worth taking 10 minutes to run. Uh, we can also make these decisions based on test flakiness. Uh, is this flaky test uh, either a really bad test or is it pointing to a particularly risky piece of code? And also test failure rate, again, that question, if a test never fails, is it really providing value? So at Puppet, we use Quilk for a couple of different things. The main one is to identify our most expensive tests. Again, we're doing that return on investment evaluation, and so starting with the most expensive is the natural place to start when determining if our tests are worth it. We can also uh, identify particularly flaky tests, which again can tell us where our code is particularly risky and where we should maybe look at either adding more tests or adding more robust tests. We can also see the failure history of tests. And lastly, we can improve developer feedback time. So this is kind of a theme of what QA at Puppet has been doing for the past year or so. And by improving our test pipeline efficiency, we can shorten the time between when developer merges code and when we can say with certainty that that code probably doesn't have bugs. So Quilk phase one was our first attempt at testing metrics in CI based on the Elk stack. Uh, and we chose the Elk stack because uh, it was an open source tool. Uh, others were using it in the house. Um, and I can go through the <laughs> Uh, the, the components of the Elk stack, but I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with what those are. Elasticsearch being the database, Logstash being the, uh, the data processing pipeline, and Kibana or Grafana, which is what we use, Grafana, um, as a visualization tool for analytics uh, and monitoring. And in the end, oops, I'm too far. Uh, in the end, we decided that um, the uh, Elk stack was not the tool for us. Uh, in that uh, what we, the questions we were actually trying to answer were not actually analytics or monitoring, they were something else. So that led us to Quelk phase two, um, which we decided to use mostly off the shelf tools uh, with the exception of one. So first off, we're going with uh, Google BigQuery. Um, and second, to replace the Logstash component, we're writing a custom application that we're naming Dr. T because it's a Muppet. <laughs> um, and then the last bit is going to be Looker, uh, which is a data visualization tool, uh, not open source, sad phase. Uh, but we, we think that these are going to provide key uh, benefits to us. Uh, Google BigQuery being that it has a uh, SQL interface, and I find that much more attractive um, than using Elasticsearch. Uh, Dr. Teeth, uh, for us, since we wrote it, uh, we're making it testable from the ground up. Um, which was a very flaky component in our old stack. Um, it would of often be the part that breaks the whole thing for us. Um, and Looker, uh, the rest of the org is also uh, coalescing on Looker uh, as a visualization tool. Um, so we're, we're really getting on board with what the rest of our org is doing. Um, but maybe we should call it Quabidarteth. <laughs> But that doesn't really roll off the tongue like Quelk, so we're just calling it Quelk 2. Um, another benefit of this is that we're decoupling ourselves from specific testing tools. In our initial implementation, um, we had a very hard uh, coupling to uh, output produced by our main testing tool. Um, we are going to uh, a standard of JUnit XML. So as long as the tool that we're using can produce JUnit XML, um, it's going to be compatible with our, our second stack. Uh, anything that's, uh, any concepts that are outside of the um, JUnit XML is going to be handled by the, uh, the Dr. Chief application that I alluded to earlier. Uh, so again, tracking tests from all the tools, 
uh, and the only dependency being JUnit XML. So uh, with the new stack, we're going to be able to um, uh, ship our custom dashboards that we create in Looker um, to uh, our initial tool confluence. Um, we're also going to be able to ship them via email. And like I said, if um, you can't answer the questions you're looking to answer with our dashboards, you can always fall back to SQL, which is uh, much easier to tell people to start using. So for those on the bleeding edge, demo time. Demo time. All right. Should you make your drive still? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can embiggen, maybe. Uh, Embiggening. Okay. So this is a looker look hooked up to our uh, data set from, that we actually collected with um, Quelk v1. So we've migrated the data into Google BigQuery and hooked up as a backend for looker. Um, what you're looking at here is, actually, can you pop up the filters? So what this is, is it's uh, average test duration uh, and individual test cases for those average test durations. So it's look defaults to the past seven months. Uh, it uh, pulls from test suites called tests, uh, which other values would be uh, pre-suite or post-suite. So we only wanna, we're only concerned right now with our tests. Uh, and we only want test cases that are in the status of pass because that's the true cost of what a test is for the full time it takes to run. So let's limit this to something that we know we're gonna get some results on. So uh, there's a project in Puppet called Puppet Server uh, Integration. So these are tests for our enterprise Puppet Server and we'll limit it to only those results. So right away you can see some um, big outliers. Uh, so this <laughs> test on average takes 400 seconds, which is extremely costly when compared with other tests. Uh, next tab. Oh. So we can explore the data a little bit closer. Um, and you can, uh, so we can take the existing uh, view that we have and uh, slice it, the data in different ways. Uh, I can tell you that specifically with this test that we're looking at, um, we did end in a refactor, we did not end in a rip out. So we, uh, we deemed it as valuable, but saw major improvements that can be made. And I think we cut the time by, uh, if it's at 400, I think it went down to less than 100, and probably, <laughs> so we, we, we got a significant time savings. The other thing we learned from drilling into this specific test is, is that as the test was written, we learned that it had never failed. So not only was it taking up a whole bunch of time, but it was taking up a whole bunch of time and never telling us anything. So this is really the kind of question or that we're trying to answer is what can we do with the, uh, the data that we have and how can we use it to shorten the feedback cycle? Because again, if a test always passes and takes a really long time to do it and you matrix that across how many platforms and everything else, you know, is it worth the cost as it's written? And the answer was no. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so what's next for the Quilk project? Uh, Quilk v1 was largely a proof of concept and proof of value to um, see if this would be a way that our uh, developers could actually improve our test suites, and it was. So next thing we wanna do is polish what we have, make it definitely more user-friendly for those who don't write, want to write SQL uh, or uh, other, like could my manager use this kind of thing? Um, we wanna find the edges of what's possible with our current stack and specifically know what we can and can't do within these off-the-shelf tools. We want to integrate with an existing tool at Puppet that identifies transient errors. So transient errors obviously kind of pollute our data and if there is an easy way to pull those transients out, then that could be, make our data sets even more valuable. 
and allow us to not have false positives for uh, tests that fail frequently or, or things of that nature. And then our kind of moonshot for this project is to dynamically tier our test cadence based on how often it's failing and how long it's running. So if a test is failing more frequently, then maybe we would move it up to a more frequent testing tier. And if it's not failing as much, move it back until maybe we even uh, like retire it. Yeah, with the, the goal being of identifying sections of the software that are currently now uh, telling you information. So tests that are telling you information about what you're trying to release right now. Yeah, it turns out that a test isn't, doesn't have the same amount of value throughout like its whole lifetime or as time goes on. So recognizing that and putting it in different tiers based on the value it's providing. Are there any questions? That's all we got. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions for Wizard Island? Uh, could, you talk, could you talk a bit more about how you can uh, use as an input any XML file from any QA or tool, right? So the question is, how can I use uh, the XML file from any tool? Like, the, are you, where is your question about the J in an XML format? You mentioned that in V2 you can consume any XML from any testing tool, right? R right. So the, the, the requirement there is that the testing tool can produce J unit XML, which is uh, a standard that we've agreed that we're going to support. And there's tons of libraries out there for many different testing tools across different languages. It seemed like the most ubiquitous um, section. Um, so was so what the, the application that we wrote does is uh, transforms that data with the addition of other th concepts about the data, such as pipeline and configuration information and run cadence um, into uh, the schema that's currently residing in our uh, BigQuery data set. Did that answer your question? So that's always standard to you yeah, so the, the reason I, I, we talked about that is our internal testing tool um, it, that we were hard coupled to in the beginning uh, injected some stuff inside the data. So it, it slammed in a bunch of extra stuff that, they were, that we were actually um, uh, requiring in our uh, log stash transformations. So anytime the data looks slightly different, things would just break for no good reason. And we really want to avoid that before. So we're making a, a hard contract, and we're going to you know, loosely couple the things together um, and enforce that contract. I could see a future where we do do uh, analysis driven, or you know, where we, we have automated procedures that do the analysis for us. Right now, it's more about making our current um, testing suites, uh, like reducing the feedback time for developers. Uh, in a maintenance mode, I could see where that would be very valuable. So we, this tool feeds into uh, an effort at Puppet called um, Acceptance Testing Efficiency. Um, and there's a whole group that's leading this. And we're running projects through it as we, um, oh, as we have the bandwidth to do it. So I know that we've run um, two through. I don't have numbers on exactly how many tests were revised, but I know we cut feedback time. Um, by more than 50% um, on both of the tools. It's just that you know what we're really catching here is things where we're, you know, we're not giving enough love to our test suites and we're not doing enough maintenance. Things that we thought were important in the past are not important in the future. So we're correcting those errors, and this is what this effort feeds into. It's also a very ongoing thing. Like I don't think we finished uh, all of the refactoring and retiring that we plan to do even just with like the first pass through. Like there's a lot of suites that we haven't even looked at yet in Quelk, so. At this point, I believe it's very much a, we've got a lot of low hanging fruit and there's a bunch more harder decisions to be made in the future about yeah. 
where we get into dynamic test tiering uh, and concepts like that. Oh, yeah. I don't think there is. There definitely are acceptance tests that, yeah, just naturally need a long time to run. But I'm not aware of a way that you could like mark that we've thought about it. Right. I, you know, I, we, we have a test tracking tool that we use, uh, TestRail, um, and I believe that we would probably, you know, <laughs> document that in there. In that, you know, if we run this through and we're like, holy cow, that test is taking like, you know, double the amount of resources that every other test in the suite is taking, you know, we'd probably look at it like the one I showed. And I know we were confident that we could keep the same quality uh, and reduce the test time, but, you know, there's going to be a barrier there. And you're right, there's going to be something where you're just like, I can't cut anymore, and this is deemed super valuable. And we believe it's in the correct tier. But, that seems like a confluence of like all several different tools all together uh, making the evaluation. Do you, do you think this will ultimately lead to uh, like a new philosophy around how you're developing tests and how people writing tests Definitely. inform their decision making? Or is this yeah. intended to always be like a reporting feedback loop? It's intended to be always like a continuous feedback, like we should always be evaluating through this. But I know from experience that, you know, just by talking about this, there's a different attitude around adding and maintaining tests. And I liken it to, it's like, well, I'm not afraid to kill my children now. Or it's like, yeah, it's my, freeing, right? yeah, well, I like, I sit down with developers now and I'm like, okay, what are you most concerned about? And they're like, X, Y, and Z. And then I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to have to try some things and it's going to either work or it's going to fail. And then we're going to evaluate. And if I write something that's bad, I'm going to kill it. I'll be the first one to kill it. And uh, when you say that, people are like, oh, okay. That's cool. Um, whereas before, the attitude of like, oh no, here comes this quality assurance engineer and he's going to write this really expensive automation that he's going to make me run all the time and it's going to make my feedback so long. Whereas now we're like, no, 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 we, we want to prove our own value. Like we are, we are holding ourselves up to the same thing that we're judging you with. So this is our tool to do that. I think there was also previously not an acknowledgement that test value changes over time. I think yeah. we would just write a test and then it would exist and run forever in the same tier. And so that has definitely been another shift in yeah, being able to kill our tests or move them around has definitely impacted that. Yes. Well, there's lots of considerations to that. Like, one of the considerations that I first think about is like, well, is it expensive everywhere, or is it only expensive sometimes? And that gets into like slicing it on the configuration. And what is configuration? <laughs> I think it's everything that informs like how a test runs. Um, like getting to these core concepts and speaking the same language is honestly one of the bigger challenges in going through this that I've had, and that. We're like, well, this is the something something upgrade platform with blah, 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 blah. And you're like, OK, well, that same test runs over here and over here. Is it the same test? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, are you sure? And then you start digging. And you're like, did you know that when you run this test on this platform, it does this extra stuff that costs like six more minutes? And you're cool with that. And I don't think it's the same test anymore. Maybe you should make this a new test. Um, because it, you can't have, like the idea of having one test like be so flexible that it can work in so many ways, I don't think it's true. <laughs> I'll agree with that. But I, I guess I'm still curious, like what, how would you 
how would you move a test like that to a different bucket or something? Like what buckets would your tests fall into categorically speaking? Yeah, so uh, we have three main buckets, like high risk, no, yeah, high, medium, low, and that's per, high runs per commit. Uh, medium runs nightly, low runs on weekends, um, possibly subject to change. But um, to throw a little mo more color into the last answer, I think that we also consider the maturity of the project that the test is for. So a test is particularly valuable when code is still being committed to that project, when that code is changing frequently, uh, when we're about to ship it, that's probably when a test is most valuable. And then after that, the, the test value precipitously drops especially if it's not failing and this is a really mature project, it's been around for a long time. So it depends on, I think that's one of the biggest considerations that we would. A risk to value relationship almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Um, so you're talking about like most expensive tests or like how expensive a test is and I'm assuming your currency here is time, like feedback, like time feedback to developers, but are you actually also considering like resource costs, like a really uh, beefy box running a short test might, you know, like there's another the same as like a long running test on a tiny rod. There's another way to think about that too, which is my time as the person who's evaluating it and has to either maintain it. So cost in the future, where is if this test is really long running, like how what is it that we're testing and how valuable is that thing and how risky is it? And how much more time will it take me to make that test better? Like me specifically. I mean, in terms of like the hardware that the thing is running on, like the differences between like which hardware that is, I don't think we have a good way of um, figuring out that yet. Yeah, the short answer to your question is probably not. I think most of the boxes we run tests, tests in are relatively the same, with the exception of the platform. But uh, I don't even know if we have data available to us on like how much CPU or disk base a uh, test uses. But it'd be interesting to look. Yeah? Um, I was wondering how far back does your data go? And when you're answering a question like this test hasn't failed in so long, at what point do you get to do you feel comfortable making the decision like this has been long enough that it hasn't failed, that we're not overfitting our sample set? Yeah, I think our current data set goes like eight months, seven months. It's not very long. Um, and I think, again, it depends a lot on, like, is this project still active? That, like, it could be a year, but the project's still active, and there's still risky changes to the code base, so this, we shouldn't retire this test even if it's not failing. Or this test hasn't failed for three months, but also it's expensive. You know, there's just a lot of considerations to make. Then did that maybe the other second part is like, would that maybe lead into maybe always changing, a, making a different type of cultural decision where you always store the data about test runs, regardless of whether or not you have reporting analytics on that data? That's how you would answer that question in the future. Yeah. I mean, we always want to like, we're trying to be. A lot of this effort is to beef up the mechanism that catch it that keeps the data, like that was a lot of our flaky problems in Quelk 1, was the, the mechanism for reporting, like how does it get the, the data get from your Jenkins pipeline out to your data store, and every bit in between, and a lot of that is improving in Quelk 2. So yeah, keep it all, all the time, forever, forever. Yeah, I mean, ideally, our Jenkins would like have a relatively good history, yeah. but yeah. our Jenkins has gone down like three times in the last couple months, so. Not always the case. Any other questions? Yeah? You mentioned that with the metrics you established in Bitcoin, now you find some uh, not as important as we used to. Could you give examples of those? Sorry, can you s say that uh, again? We used to pay attention to specific things in default B2, B uh, something that you paid attention to. Now you, after looking at the data, you see that it's no longer important to you. Could you give examples of those? Can you possibly repeat the question? Uh, I think what you're asking is we used to have data in V1 that we weren't using, and we cut that out in V2. What was that data? Was that the question? Mm, not quite. Uh, I guess how you spend your time and what you think. 
Oh. How much has run, so how effective it is. I think. With more data you collected with your new setup, you found that you shift your focus to something else? I think that what we're dancing around is um, that the original stack was intended as like uh, a metrics platform and analytics and that wasn't the correct tool for the job. Like what the questions that we're talking about here are not really those things. Like we're more c concerned about historical accuracy of like how many times a test fails, how many times a test passes in a given window of time. And those weren't questions that the ELK stack was particularly well suited to answering. Uh, and that was the main reason we moved off it. I think, is that, okay, thank you. Any more questions for our ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause for the Wizard Island Ghosts, please. <laughs>